one year ago, our world turned upside down. But our new journey just began. Columbus Avenue Baptist Church Online Ministry. And here is our amazing story. We had laughs. We had frustrations. We got closer despite distancing. To God, to each other by staying connected in new ways. have reached all around the world. Followers from Texas to New York to Japan. Over 177 followers. God is amazing. Thank you for an amazing year. Watch out 2021. We are just getting started. Welcome you to worship with Columbus Avenue Baptist Church. Those of you who are joining us online and those who are here in the sanctuary, I pray that God will bless you, that today we will truly have a wonderful day as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think of how awesome he is and what he's done for us. Marvelous grace that he has poured out into our lives. 
And you know, as we go through difficult times and as we go through challenges, it's good to know that Jesus told us to take heart, for I have overcome the world. It is a wonderful gift to us, and today we get to celebrate that. So before we sing, I want you to join with me as we pray together. Father, thank you for the grace of Jesus. Thank you for his forgiveness and for his hope. Father, thank you that today we have the privilege of opening your word, that we have the privilege of joining together, that we have the privilege of knowing you. And so, Father, I pray that today you would speak to our hearts, that first you would encourage us with the music that we would celebrate and worship you with everything that we have. And then, Father, I pray that you would be with us as we open your word. Speak to us so that you might transform us so that we might reflect Jesus Christ to a world. For it's in his precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's join our hearts together and let's sing.
go ahead and take a moment and open your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in a moment in verse 17. And as you're looking for that passage, today I am preaching a message that is the reason I preach through books. Because sometimes we come to passages of Scripture that if we really wanted to, we would want to skip over those passages. They're very important passages. They're passages that speak to us. But far too often we come to passages like we're going to look at today and we want to ignore them. But as we do, it's important for us to go through the entire Word of God so that we can understand what God's saying to us. And so with that statement, I want you to join with me as we talk to our Heavenly Father. Father, thank you for your Word. Father, for your word, which speaks to us truth. And Father, many times we don't want to hear the truth. But Father, we need your truth, for we are to live in your truth. And when we live in your truth, we live in your light. And when we live in your light, we find your grace and your hope. We also find, Father, the power of your spirit to transform and to change us so that we can be shaped into the image of Jesus, so that the world might see through our lives you. And so, Father, today, let us open our hearts before you and let your Spirit speak to us. For, Father, this we ask and pray through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Today we're going to talk about hypocrisy. That which is saying one thing and doing another. Making a stand for something and then falling right in line with what you are taking a stand against. It's a challenge that every human being, but especially we who are believers in Jesus Christ, we struggle with because it's so easy to be drawn back into the ways that we are not to be. And then we find ourselves caught in that. So today we need to take a look at what it means to be a hypocrite. And what does God expect when he finds us and we acknowledge that we find ourselves in hypocrisy? Well, to start, I just want us to take a look at a few quotes from somebody else so that we get an introspective and an outward perspective of what hypocrisy is. And some of these are going to make you laugh. Some of these are going to make you wince. But I just want you to think about what some of these statements are. When I was in high school, I was part of a senior play. It was my senior year, and I actually got to be the lead in the, in the play. It was, it was a fun experience. It was a challenging experience because we did it in the round. Uh, we didn't put it on a stage. We did it in the middle of our floor there in the gym, and people were around us. And so... Uh, we had to go in and out from different places. It was a unique way of doing it. It was kind of fun. But we did Noel Coward's play called The Blythe Spirit, which is about ghosts who haunt a husband. First, one ghost of the wife who had passed, and then ultimately the second ghost would be of the wife. But they weren't supposed to ever show up because he had had some weird things happen, and so he called in a medium and in that medium, this medium was a charlatan, a con artist. And yet somehow all of this takes place. In the middle of the play, though, Noel Coward puts this line. It is discouraging to think how many people are shocked by honesty and how few by deceit. In other words, this whole play is about deceit and dealing with honesty, and we are shocked when somebody's honest. When we take a look at our world today, sometimes we're shocked when we hear honesty, real honesty. But you see, I like the way Abraham Lincoln put it when he talked about hypocrisy. He, talked to, he says, I care not for a man's religion whose dog and cat are not better for it. In other words, how will he treat his fellow man if he doesn't treat his dog and his cat well? That's hypocrisy. <clears throat> George Orwell, who wrote 1984, which if you haven't read it, it 
talks about a day in which Big Brother comes upon us and has changes in things, but he makes this statement, and he writes it many years before 1984. <clears throat> he says, the, peace, the ministry of peace concerns itself with war, the ministry of truth with lies, the ministry of love with torture, and the ministry of plenty with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental, nor do they result from the ordinary hypocrisy. They are deliberate exercises in doublethink. Here we've got the opposite. Well, you say that you're for peace, but you're really for war. You say you're for truth, but you're really for lies. You're all about love, but you're all about hurting your fellow man. You're all about having more than enough, and you're dealing with starvation. That's what hypocrisy does. Ralph Aldo Emerson put it very simply. He said, the louder we talk of his honor, the faster we hide the spoons. Somebody's talking all about his honor and how good he is. He says, let's hide the spoons. We're afraid of what they will do. Mark Green put it this way. He said, the self-righteous scream judgments against others to hide the noise of the skeletons dancing in their own closets. Kind of speaks for itself. D.A. Carson, who's a theologian, not the one who has been serving in, in the administration of our past administration with President Trump, <clears throat> but the D.A. Carson, who is a theologian and a writer of many books, he put it this way. He said, the, per the worst possible heritage to leave children is high spiritual pretensions and low performance. We sound good, but we don't do what we say. Then there's this statement. I'm annoyed by those who love mankind, but are discourteous to people. We can say we love all of mankind, but if we aren't nice to those around us. You see, it paints the picture of hypocrisy. And Scripture speaks of that, and Paul speaks of that as he's writing to the, the church there in Rome. And Now remember, Rome's got both Jews and Gentiles in it. And as he's writing this, he writes to them, and he speaks first, of course, as a Jew to Jews. But he paints a picture that the Gentiles could understand and everybody would grasp. Because in it, he says in verse 17, now you, who call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, you know that God has blessed you with his law. If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in darkness, an instructor for the foolish, a teacher of children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. The Old Testament for them was truly the picture of God's word. It is the essence of God himself as he brings his truth to his people and he sets before them how they live their life and he shows them their failures and he shows them their success when they're disobedient and when they're obedient. But in that he says, if you're teaching now, out of God's word in this manner, and you have this in his word, but then you teach others, but you do not teach yourself. In other words, you don't even know your own lessons. You preach against stealing, and yet you steal. You say people should not commit adultery, yet you commit adultery. You abhor idols. Do you rob temples? You boast in the law. Do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Thus circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then if you who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? 
the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law, will condemn you who, even though you have been the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. But a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. He starts out by talking, do you teach others? Are you those who make statements to others about how they should live? And he gives us pictures of that. He says, are you one who will lead the blind? Are you telling the blind the truth of what you're leading them to and around and where they actually are? Are you a light for those in darkness? In this world is dark and you understand that you live your life so that those in darkness might see their way to find their way out of the darkness. Are you instructor for the foolish? Are there, are there those who are caught in the foolishness of this world? And are you able to come to instruct them and lead them to out of their foolishness into truth? Are you the embodiment of knowledge and truth? Thus are you a teacher of children. Do children really learn from you? If not, do you really even teach yourself? You, he's warning them. He's saying, you claim you teach the way and you teach the truth. But do you, in essence, not teach the truth? Because you may say what is true and live in another way. We've seen evidence of that over and over again. But sometimes the toughest place for us to see that evidence is when you and I take a look at our own lives. Do we really hold to the truth that Jesus Christ set for us? Do we live in a way that will truly bring honor to him? Or do we, by our actions, demonstrate the difference that he makes? Or do we demonstrate that we're no different than anybody else? Because you see, it's not what we say. It's what we do. It's how we act. It's what we respond to. That is why he paints all of these pictures. He says, when you do that, well, then do you tell them not to steal? And do you steal? In other words, are you more interested in money for you than you are about others? Are you doing everything you can to con your way into what they give you? Or are you busy showing them the difference of Christ and telling them this is not the way it is because of what Christ has done? Do you say you should not commit adultery? You should not have an affair. You should have one, one woman that is your wife or you should have one husband that is your husband and you stayed there. Or have you fallen into the sin? Or are you even in the midst of committing adultery? And we, of course, have seen that far too often. We see these things. He says then, do you abhor the idols? Do you abhor the ways of the world? Or do you? And then he says this statement. He says, do you rob temples? He says, in other words, do you say that what the idols are doing, what the ways of the world is, and then you go in there and you take from them? When we look at how to live our lives, are we learning more from the scripture or are we learning more from the newspaper or from the books that we read or from our own thoughts and ideas? Is God really the one who is leading us? That is what Paul is trying to drive home here to the church. Because as he's driving at home, this is a church that sits in the seat of power of the world at that day. And God has done a marvelous work to reach into the lives of these people. And now they sit in a place where they're going to have to present the gospel. And are they going to be able to present it to those who really need to hear it? Because is their faith 
a faith that is for show or is there faith for that which is life? Is it really going to be standing up in the midst of the trials and the tribulations that life brings? Because he says, when you act like the world, in spite of having the claim of Jesus Christ, then you, notice what he says in verse 24. He says, we thou now show how God is viewed among the world. Because this is what he says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. When we don't live for Jesus and we don't allow him to come through and we're not loving the world as Jesus directed and we're not living in obedience to our Father as the Father directed, then he is blasphemed by those that are around us. They are blasphemed by those that are out in the world. One of the pains of a pastor specifically me, is what I've seen over the years in my life. When I was just a brand new believer, I had been a believer maybe a year, when there was rancor that went on inside the life of our church. And I watched how people who said that they loved one another had pulled apart and how they attacked others and they even attacked the people that they claim to love and respect and i watched that church split and when i when that took place i can still remember being with my dad and my dad said that's what christians do now he had never held back that we couldn't go to church he had he had really in my view had never done a whole lot but i had watched him tell pastors not to come into our home. I'd watched him not want to do anything for him because I would hear him mutter under his breath, they're, they're not real. They're not true. And it's because he had watched a man literally steal the farm out from under his family when he was a young boy. He saw that. And it warped him because he saw what people had done who claimed to be believers. And he had seen it through the years over and over again. They said one thing and did another. When he would be on the job, it was not the Christians that he turned to because they were the ones that weren't responsible. He looked for people who were responsible and he couldn't find them among the Christians. And he said that, I don't trust them. But he never stopped us from going because there was this innate understanding of God, but how that had besmirched what God, what he had seen about God. I think that's why he loved watching Billy Graham, because here was somebody who seemed to present the truth of Jesus and seemed to live it and continued to live it through his life. Because you see, when we are not living it before the world, then all of a sudden when they begin to see that we are failures, and we know that we are still sinners saved by grace. As we talked about last week, we understand that we are sinners and we are under God's judgment, but the beauty is, is by his grace, he's redeemed us. And now our task is to be able to show the difference that he makes as he changes us. Yes, I used to be that way, but now I'm no longer that way. I am allowing God to change my actions, change my attitudes, change how I speak, change how I live, so that the world might see that Jesus has made a difference in my life. That's what he means here. He says it's because it's how the world views God, by how they see us as believers. When I was going through and finding these different... Uh, quotes on hypocrisy. Many of the longer quotes, so many of them dealt with the fact that there were those who claimed to be believers and did not live that life. So what needs to happen? 
Because you see, in essence, he's telling us, here's where the real crux is. This is where the real point is. It's not so much in your actions, it's in your heart. Because unless the heart changes, that which is inside of us changes, the actions will not change. But once the heart changes, it begins to change how we act. And once the heart changes, it not only changes how we act, it changes how our attitude goes. That which transforms us. And Jesus' grace is there to transform us. So he says this, So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as circumcised? Now he's using this Jewish illustration. When a boy is born, they circumcise him early. And thus he has the Jewish tradition. He had the Jewish law. He was taught from a very young age. And if he lived that manner, they would consider him a Jew because he would live what they could not see, which was the circumcision. But they knew it was there. But God said, look at all of these who have been circumcised and have not done my will. The Old Testament is filled. So here Paul says, it's not so much the circumcision of the flesh, but it's the circumcision of the heart. And if the heart is circumcised to the Jew first and to the Gentile, God will bring the change. For he says, notice what he says, the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you. Even though you have the written code and the circumcision, you now are a lawbreaker. Just because you say you are doesn't mean you are. But if you show that you are, then God has done something in you. Because notice what he says next. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. Jeremiah said God is going to come and he's going to give you a new heart. It's going to be the circumcision not of the flesh but of the heart. And you see, God comes to change us on the inside. It's not the actions that come out of us that result. It results out of what's in our heart. And when it's in our heart, when God has circumcised it, it changes our actions. Because he says, when one is circumcised by the heart, he is circumcised by the Spirit. That is the Spirit of the living God who comes to dwell inside of every believer. He has come to change our heart to where our heart, which was a heart of stone, and that heart of stone has been removed so that God could put in his heart of flesh so that we could have a heart that again beats and cares and is moved. And he says that heart is the heart that is driven by the Spirit. And it's not just the written code. It's not just the Bible. But now the Bible becomes life. You see, the Bible is the Word of God. And the Word of God can change your life. But unless you have the Spirit in your life who has changed your heart, you're not going to hear what He is saying to you through His Word. That's why so many people go, I don't understand what this means. It's because they have not had their heart changed. And when God changes your heart, he begins to open the door of what his word says. And it begins to blossom and flourish alive in us as he changes our heart. It is our heart. Thus a person's praise is not for other people. They're not looking for praise from people now. You see, if our hearts are not what it is, and we're only doing that as a performance, we're looking for others, other people to praise us. We're looking for somebody to say something good about us, and we want them to say that because we will put on whatever facade to get them to say something good. But he says when he changes your heart, you're not worried about what others say. You're worried about what your heavenly Father says. And when you're worried about what your Heavenly Father says, what He has taught you will be reflected in your actions. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, He will so transform us so that we will express Christ through our lives, through our words, through our actions. 
so that the world might see not us, but him. You see, it's the commitment of the heart, empowered by the Spirit. You see, Jesus even gave us this warning. It's not just Paul, but Jesus did. I want you to hear the words of Jesus today. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their platteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets, their most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace, to be called rabbi by others. But you are not called rabbi, for you have one teacher, one. And you are brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father. He is in heaven. Nor are you to call instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, he says, there is a difference. And the difference comes because the Messiah teaches you. The Messiah is God in the flesh. And how did he teach us? He humbled himself and became one of us. How did he teach his apostles? As he's preparing to go to the cross, as the agony is starting to do and he's giving his last time with the disciples, what does he do? In the upper room, he takes a basin of water, wraps a towel around his waist, and washes his disciples' feet, which is the task of the lowliest servant. That's what Jesus does. And he shows that servants to us as he goes all the way to the cross to be the ultimate servant for you and for me as he would die upon the cross serving us. Serving us so that he could take our sin. So that he could then infill us with his life to remove our sin and give us his righteousness. And when he gives us his righteousness, we live our life as he lived his life, in humility, as a servant, a servant of the people, a servant of our friends, a servant of our neighbors, a servant of those who we so desire to see Jesus come into their life. Let us learn to serve one another. Let us be there praying that God would use us to touch lives, use us to be his servant. Because when we do, then he will exalt us. Then we will find God being pleased with us. It's not what man thinks. It's what your father thinks, your heavenly father, who sent his son, so that you might have life. Jesus came that you and I might know our Father. When we know our Father, we'll do what He says. I pray that you will come to know the Father through the Son today. And if you don't know Him, may you receive Him. If you do know Him, I pray that you will allow him to fill you with his humility so that you might make a difference in the lives of those around you. I want you to bow your head with mine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his humility. Thank you for his servanthood. 
Thank you that he lived a life in absolute connection and perfection to you so that as the Son of God in human form could die our death so that he could offer us this new life. And Father, let us receive that life and help us to live our lives in a way that will bring honor and glory to you. Fill us, strengthen us, transform us. Thank you for giving us Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing as the deer. But as we do, if you've made one of those decisions, please let us at the church know. Let one of the men or one of the ladies at the church know that you have made this decision. And I pray that we'll all get it back to me, and I know they will. And we will make communication and we will talk about your decision. But not only that, I pray that God will draw you closer and closer to himself and that we will be able to help you as you begin that walk with him. Now, today's message has been one that is difficult for a pastor because it's the old adage. I, st I heard it when I was in college. I heard it again in seminary and I've heard it at preaching conferences over and over again. And it's the adage of, if somebody points a finger, which we're good at, you know, we can point a finger. When we point that finger, it's a reminder we may point one out there, but three of them are coming back. And as your pastor, I want you to pray for me that my walk will reflect the difference Jesus makes in my life. And I need your prayers to do that. Because all of us need each other's prayers so that we can live a life that truly reflects Jesus Christ. And so with that, today before we sing, I offer you this. May the blessing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loves us, who has served us, who has given us our life, may we reflect him as he has changed our hearts, that our heart might be his heart and we might show people the difference that Jesus makes. And thus we, you and I, will be blessed. May God bless you as you give honor to him. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.